Now, as a digression, if you did want to calculate yield uh, accounting for accrued interest, potentially in the case where you were doing it not right after a coupon, but somewhere in between coupon payments, uh, as a digression, here is how you would do it. You can use the yield uh, function in, in Excel, and you need to specify the settlement date. Now, this doesn't have to be an even uh, right after coupon date anymore. This can be any point in time. Uh, so if we wanted to, for example, get the yield to maturity of a bond that has 21.5 uh, or 21.75 years to maturity, uh, we could actually put in, I guess, something around March of the year 2000 and for settlement date, that would be a quarter of the way through the first year. And the yield function given a settlement date and a maturity date, the annual coupon rate, the bond price, remember, is a percentage of par, the face value is a percentage of par, usually the face value will be 100% of par, of course, and a number of coupons per year, this yield function will give you uh, what the yield on this bond is, even taking into account accrued interest. Now, we don't have to do this uh, for the purposes of our class, but it's useful for you to know that it's out there, and I encourage you to actually try this. So now let's compare the effective annual yield uh, for two bonds. One bond that has an annual coupon of 80, uh, but pays the coupon all at once, once per year. And another that has an annual coupon of 80, but pays it semi-annually. In other words, uh, two payments of 40. So what uh, would we expect to have in terms of uh, effective annual yield for both of these bonds? And why would there be a difference? Uh, let's calculate this out. All right, so let's draw the timelines in this case, and let's calculate the IRR first, and then from that, the effective annual yield. So for the three-year bond, it costs 900 in year zero, pays you 80, 80, 10, 80 in years one, two, and three. So the IRR should be pretty straightforward by now. 12.18%, this is the per period IRR, but now this is actually also equal to the EAY, because remember, this is an annual IRR already, that is the effective annual yield. What about the semi-annual coupon bond? Well, this one still costs 900 in the beginning, but then pays us 40 in the first period, which is the first half of year one, then 40 in the second period, which is the second half of year one, 40 and 40 in the first and second half of year two, and 40 and 1040 in the first and second halves of year three. So let's get the IRR of this. Six point oh four. Now remember this is an IRR per period. So to get an effective annual yield, we actually have to transform this to an annual rate that includes compounding. So that is going to be, remember, 1 plus the per period rate, in this case, the yield to maturity over 2. Now to get the yield to maturity, we would multiply the 6% by 2, so let's just skip the multiplying and dividing by 2 and just add the per period yield already. And we're going to exponentiate that to the number of periods in the year, which is of course 2, and subtract 1. And that is 12.44%. Now it's worth asking ourselves where this difference comes from. Why is it that the effective annual yield on the semi-annual coupon bond with the same coupon per year and the same price 
same face value, why is that higher? Well, the total amount of cash inflows is the same, the total cash outflow is the same, but what's different is we get our cash back sooner. We get that first coupon payment of 40, a half year before we get our big coupon payment of 80 in the single uh, annual payment case. And in the meantime, this first coupon payment of 40 has had time to earn interest on its own. So this idea of interest earning interest is why the total rate of return on a bond that pays more frequently is higher. Now another type of question that we can ask ourselves is sort of a reverse. Uh, we know given a price how to calculate a yield, but we can actually reverse our steps and calculate a yield, uh, sorry, we can calculate uh, a price given a yield. So let's look at this example where we have a three-year bond, a face value of a thousand, and a semi-annual coupon of 40. Now, we don't know the price of this bond, but we know its yield. Can we figure out the price? Um, well, of course we can, because remember, the yield is simply the uh, discount rate that actually gives you the bond's price. So all we have to do is discount the cash flows. Um, but we have to first, since this is a semi-annual or higher frequency than annual anyway, coupon bond, um, we have to convert our yield to maturity that is expressed in annual terms into a per period yield. So let's do this. All right, so if the yield to maturity is 10% on the semi-annual bond, to get its price, we essentially need to work backward. First of all, we have to get the per period required rate of return, and then we have to discount all of the cash flows from this bond by that rate. So if the yield to maturity is 10% for the whole year, well then for the half year, it's gonna be 10% over two, right? Or 5%. Now we can just compute the present values of each of these cash flows occurring in half years one through six, or in other words, the first and second halves of year one year two, and year three, and add them up, and that'll get us the present value of this whole bond, aka its price. So what is the present value of the cash flow occurring in the first half of the first year? Well, that's the cash flow discounted at one plus the per period rate of 5% to the number of periods, which is one half year period. Except let's format this as a number. Let's in fact format all of these as numbers, uh, but actually let's just sort of drag this out. Oh, before we do that, remember, make static references. Now we should be able to drag this out. And so what then is the present value? Well, we're going to add up all of the present values of the individual payments of this bond. Again, we can think of this as effectively six zero coupon bonds, except that we again need to format this as a number. Let's give it two decimal places, 949.24. Good. Now, the last thing that is helpful to know is just as there is an advanced uh, calculator for yield to maturity with uh, potentially accrued interest, there's also one for price. Now, this will give you the clean price um, even with accounting for accrued interest. Again, you can put in any time for, uh, for settlement here. Uh, partway through a year or partway through a coupon period and it'll take into account how much accrued interest has actually accrued, subtract it out, and this will give you a clean price. Um, this is important to remember, this is going to be the clean price, not the dirty price, uh, but then you can always get the dirty price by adding back in 
the accrued interest. Now, how does a bond behave <clears throat> as time passes? Well, let's imagine we've got three types of bonds that we've talked about before, the premium, the discount, and the par bond. And let's say that the yield to maturity, in other words, these bonds are risky enough that uh, the fair expected return is 5%, and it stays that way. So the companies that issue them don't become more risky, they don't become less risky. Uh, they stay at a certain uh, state of the world that justifies a 5% required return on all of these bonds. So, of course, as you remember, a premium bond pays a coupon that is above the yield. So let's say it pays a coupon of 10%. A par bond must pay a coupon equal to the yield, so its coupon is 5%, and the discount bond pays a coupon below the yield, so its coupon is 3%. And let's say these are 30-year bonds. Um, how do their prices evolve intuitively as time passes? Well, we can actually uh, best explain this by looking at what would happen at the very end in year 30. All of these bonds, assuming that they don't default and if you to maturity has stayed constant, presumably the risk of default has not gone up, so we can expect the principal to be repaid. The principal is the face value, right? So actually in year 30, all three of these bonds will pay you the face value. They'll pay you a thousand dollars. That means that in year 30, all three of these bonds must be worth a thousand exactly. And so then if we know that the premium bond started above par, the discount bond started below par, and of course we can also imagine a zero coupon bond, which is like a super discount bond, if you will, it pays no coupon at all, and therefore starts even lower below par, the par bond starts at par, of course. All of these bonds will end up at the same place. That means that over time, the premium bond will decrease in price. The zero coupon bond will appreciate most. The discount bond will appreciate some. The par bond will stay exactly the same. The price of all of these bonds effectively then gets pulled to par. And it means that all of them will actually end up offering you the same total return of 5%, the required rate of return. The reason that that'll happen even for, let's say, the premium bond, which technically offers you a very high coupon, well, it makes up for that, and you get to a lower all-in return of 5%, despite a coupon rate of 10%, precisely because of this capital loss as the price of the bond gets pulled to par and goes from trading at about 180% of par to par at the very end. Now the discount bond, that one only offers you a 3% coupon, but it makes up for that and gets to the 5% total return uh, to maturity by a bit of a capital gain, so it goes from trading at about 70% of par to, again, 100% of par. The zero coupon bond trades by the look of it, at almost 20% of par only, but then appreciates again to 100% of par, and that is how it provides you that 5% uh, per year return. More generally, if the yield to maturity does fluctuate, of course the company can become more risky, it can become less risky, therefore the required rate of return on its debt can go up or down, that'll have an effect on price. And the higher the discount rate, the lower the price should be, right? So we can sort of visualize if we have the same <clears throat> bond through time. In the graph above, we can see how its yield oscillates through time between 4% and 6%. And we can then plot how its price gets pulled to par Sometimes when the yield is as low as 4%, its price is as high as what it would be 
at this maximal bound with a price assuming 4% yield in yellow dashes. Sometimes its yield goes as high as 6%, and then its price is as low as what this theoretically implied price with a 6% yield in purple dashes is. And it oscillates in this channel, and eventually gets pulled to 100% of power. Now what is the relationship between uh, yield to maturity and price formalized? Well, we know since the yield is the discount rate, it should be inverse. Uh, but it's important that it is inverse and convex. Um, so let's actually look at a few bonds with different prices and yields uh, to get a sense of that. Now convexity is going to be really important um, when we talk about interest risk management later on. So let's characterize the relation between bond price and bond yield. Uh, here you can see the timeline of cash flows for a semi-annual three-year uh, bond with an 8% annual coupon rate. In each period you get half of the annual coupon. Instead of a total of 80 you get 40. And in the final period, you get both the last coupon payment of 40 plus the repayment of principal of 1,000. So let's calculate the yield to maturity on this bond at different prices. Now remember, an easy way to calculate yield to maturity is to use IRR with the caveat that the IRR is going to be the per period IRR. So if we're doing a semi-annual bond, that means we'll need to double it to get the yield to maturity. So let's first consider what would happen if this bond cost us $600. Remember the initial cash flow is gonna be negative because we're actually buying it for 600. We're receiving the stream of cash flows in exchange and the IRR is the return across this entire stream of cash flows. So let's compute the IRR of these values give it a starting value of 0.1 and we see the IRR is 14% so if the bond cost us 600 the yield to maturity would be 14 no remember this is a per period IRR there's two periods in the year so the yield is actually twice that or 28% now 600 may be too good of a deal let's try the IRR if the bonds price were 800. Well then the IRR is 8%, the yield to maturity therefore is twice that or 16%. What if the price of this bond were a thousand? Now remember this would be a par bond so we don't even have to do any math. We already know what this yield to maturity is going to be. should be equal to the coupon rate, right? Let's see if it is. And indeed, the per period IRR is 4%. Twice that is 8%, which is the coupon rate. And finally, let's try a price of 1200 And in this case, the IRR is a mere 1%. The yield to maturity is twice that, or 2%. Now, let's uh, visualize this relationship. And the best way to do that is to create a plot. Let's create a linear scatter plot. I'll drag this up so you can see it. Resize it a bit. There. Now indeed you can see two important things immediately. The relation between bond price here on the horizontal axis and yield on the vertical is indeed negative. And importantly, you can see that it is indeed also convex. It's not linear, but it is curving, so the rate of change in the yield is different depending on the magnitude of the price.